<laughs> All right, I've... let's start. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here, and thanks for sharing your St. Patrick's Day with us. And uh, I'm Wayne Robertson. I'm with Northwest Leadership Associates, a search firm that's helping the board with the selection of the new superintendent. I want to thank everyone for being here. As you know, our candidate will make opening remarks. And then um, a district administrator, Chris Hagel, will be asking the questions that have been submitted earlier and um, the candidate will answer the questions. So um, she's gonna start with her opening marks, uh, remarks and um, we'll have plenty of time for questions. We have one hour allocated for this session. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Kristen Barr. Kristen is the superintendent of the Eatonville School District. Kristen, they're all yours. All right. Well, thank you very, very much um, for joining me this evening. Um, I hope that this evening is um, a time where you can sit back, uh, listen to questions and get to know who I am, both as a leader, as a person, and as your potential superintendent. Uh, my name is Creston Barr, and there are some things that, um, that I hope that you uh, walk away with. I am the superintendent of Eatonville School District. Um, I have been a superintendent for um, eight years and uh, I'm gonna cover this up right here. Um, apologize, I apologize. Um, you know, this is a great example of how um, this pandemic and um, not being in person with you and not being able to see you in person. In fact, I'm actually looking at myself speaking, which is a little <laughs> disconcerting. Um, so um, let me start back 35 years ago. I graduated from Pacific Lutheran University and I was a fresh uh, teacher out looking for a position. Um, I knew that I wanted to work for a vivacious, vibrant school district. And at that time in 1985, um, there were not a lot of jobs at that time. And so I had the opportunity to um, start to work for the Tacoma School District um, at Stewart Middle School. Now, Stewart Middle School at that time was a uh, junior high. And so I was hired as the ninth grade um, uh, science and health teacher. And, but really, I think I was hired because I said that I would uh, be, I would coach gymnastics and that I would uh, put on the play. And so um, I had an opportunity to be in the Tacoma School District um, for 10 years as a middle school uh, science and health teacher. And as such, um, it was my pleasure to um, really get good at what um, teaching and learning was. I learned that I didn't know much coming out of school. And so I had an opportunity to work for amazing leaders who gave me permission and the ability to be able to expand and learn my knowledge. And as part of that, um, I explored almost everything there was to, to do and be as a middle school teacher. I have been a department head. I have, as I said, coached. I've coached a variety of different sports, some of which I'm very good at others of which I'm not very good at, but being part of the school. Um, I've also, one passion I have as a science teacher is I always wanted to bring curiosity and the ability for students to do authentic work right into the classroom. And so as such, I applied for and was accepted into the Science Education Partnership with the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. And that was way back in the early days, I believe maybe the second or third group that went through there. And that is a program that has existed for quite some time, but it's very different than a professional development. You go in and you work with leading scientists up in Seattle. My first was in the University of Washington, um, working around the lab, um, the C. Elegans lab. And I learned so many things that I never learned in college and that I can pass on to students. The second part is, that you partner with those organizations, which has been, that is part of who I am, both as a leader and an educator, but bringing in experts and then expanding knowledge. So I had the ability to bring our students to Fred Hudge Cancer Research Center and work with leading scientists. So that really was one of the most um, impactful 
um, learning experiences for myself as a teacher, but also for my students. So I spent 10 good years getting to be a really good science teacher. I tried to be as good as I could um, and learned everything that I could. Um, and that is a quality that I spend time learning, doing, and growing. So at the end of 10 years, I really wanted, I felt like I had really gotten this good. I was, I understood the middle school curriculum, um, but really what my passion has always been is biological science. I wanted to be a science teacher. I wanted to teach AP biology and I wanted to expand and teach health. So I was hired at Mount Tahoma High School and I spent eight years at Mount Tahoma High School with a variety of amazing leaders. Um, we did, so I taught health and I also taught um, biology. I worked mm -hmm. with an amazing department, a science department. I did the second round with uh, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center Science Education Partnership. And I did that at the Fred Hutch. Um, that was again, the most profound um, connection that I have made both as an educator, but also as a learner. Um, and I taught um, nine through 12. I've taught physics. I've taught almost every kind of science. I did a little dab in chemistry, um, but I really uh, learned and growed. I, I grew as a, both as an educator and um, had the opportunity to work with just amazing um, administration. Um, during that time, we did quite a few things. Um, that was the time that the Gates grant came out with the High Achiever grant. And so one commitment that we had made as a uh, staff was uh, and wrote the grant together. There were a couple schools in Tacoma that wrote that grant. Um, we did receive that grant and it was um, a significant amount of money for professional development. But the reason that we did that is um, that all of our students received four-year um, college degrees if they qualified for free and reduced mm -hmm. lunch. So that was one of the first venues in terms of leading and leadership that I uh, was tapped. Um, part of that grant is that we divided into four vertical teams. So that was nine through 12, and we divided the school into fours. And when we did that, um, I was asked to lead the first, um, actually the fourth uh, vertical team. And so I was the teacher leader and I hadn't been in that role before. The second part of um, my opportunity and growth into being a leader um, was that the principal at that time tapped me and said, would you be in charge of the WSU um, co-teach program. And that was a program that was out of WSU, but the student teachers came directly to Tacoma. Mm -hmm. And then we correlated with a vertical articulation down into middle school and into elementary um, for our student teachers to work together. They grew together. They had sessions together, um, but I had the ability to, to also um, impact professional development for the mentor teachers. And so those two pieces, kind of spiked my curiosity and made me excited about the next steps in teacher leadership. Um, so at that point, I went back to school. I got my master's degree in educational leadership. And I thought, I really thought I was gonna be a high school principal. And at that time there were no openings, um, but there was an opening in the middle school. So I had the opportunity to be uh, hired by um, a former Peninsula superintendent, Terry Bauck, uh, into the role of assistant principal at Gray Middle School, which is right on the south end of Tacoma uh, Mall. And um, I spent three years there and I learned a lot. I was going from a very beloved teacher to a role where really discipline, safety, um, and all of the aspects of an assistant principal. And that was new for me. And so I really wanted to learn and understand, right? And be the best assistant principal that I could be. And I felt, um, you know, at the end of my three years that I was really excited and ready. And an opening came up for Stewart Middle School where I had spent 10 years, years ago. So I had an opportunity to interview and uh, was selected as the principal there. And then through that, I was there for several years and then had a leadership opportunity uh, to 
oversee the school improvement grants for Tacoma. Um, that was an, the, a federal program that we applied for. I actually love to write grants and that is something that I enjoy. I enjoy bringing in money um, so that people can use it to grow professionally so that all students can be successful. So I had an opportunity to uh, oversee, um, there were four schools impacted. There was Hunt, there was Geodrone, there was Stewart and there was um, Jason Lee. And so overseeing the transformation, the turnaround for those schools, and then being the fiscal agent and responsible for uh, reporting back to the Department of Education. Um, so I was the direct contact for that. There was a million dollars a year for each of the three schools times three. So there was over $9 million. And that was really my first foyer into large system transformation. Um, we had a variety of different other schools during the time um, that, um, so first I was the SIG uh, project manager over the skit, SIG, and then I became the middle school director over 6,000 middle school students in Tacoma. And that was all growth. I had an opportunity, just an amazing um, uh, journey through working with just wonderful educators and leaders um, through, I've worked with Sammy and Soda leaders as they transformed Stewart into a STEM school um, and had the ability to remove barriers. That was really what I was working with schools around vision, mission, and then removing barriers and making sure that they were able to spend their money on what they absolutely wanted to spend. And so that was a joy and a privilege. Um, from that, I would, you know, we had um, other schools that wanted to participate. So with the union president at that time, uh, Andy Coons, we um, came together and we talked about what would some other transformational schools be. Uh, we had the ability to, um, and worked through with the staff at Baker Middle School to be a national board school. And there were a variety of other um, middle years, um, Montessori, um, so it was a pleasure and a privilege to work with such gifted uh, leaders and um, in a district that really was uh, supporting academic success. And at that time, I also, um, when I was a principal, I was the principal um, president of the association. And during that time, I got my superintendent credential. I was really looking around for people that, um, leaders, um, female leaders that um, had um, the ability to move, uh, the ability to uh, impact change. I was really, really interested in uh, change management and systems dynamic. As a scientist and a biologist, I believe strongly in systems. I believe that we have to start at the front, build really robust systems, have expectations, but also that it has to be collaborative. So I was very interested in finding other female leaders because at that time, most of my mentors had been men. Um, and so reaching out and really looking throughout the state. Um, I would like to just do a shout out, Sharon Bauer, who now leads Washington State Leadership Academy, but she was really instrumental in me realizing um, my next step and the capability and the possibility of being able to lead a school district. And so I went into the superintendent uh, program knowing that I really, I do understand large urban school districts and had worked there for 28 years and was very confident and competent. Um, what I didn't know is what would it be like to really look at a smaller, very personal, because the one thing that I really missed was seeing students. I have been a teacher. I'm a teacher at heart. I have teachers in my, in my, um, in my life. Um, it, my daughter is a teacher. Uh, my husband is a teacher, a uh, former teacher. He is also a superintendent. I have been married for 36 years, 35 or 36. We've been together since high school. Um, and uh, we have three children and might have a daughter-in-law and a son-in-law that are also educators. So um, I have raised three children, all college graduates. I'm so proud of them. And, but what I'm really proud of right now is that I'm a Nana and I am, um, I have uh, three grandchildren and one on the way. 
So with that, um, I know that I'm talking, I'm a talker, so I'm going to um, just finish this up. I apologize, Chris. Um, You're fine. To get a lot in because I know that I want people to know who I am and where I came from. Um, I've been a superintendent for eight years in Eatonville and um, had the opportunity to be hired as a transformational uh, superintendent. Um, and so with that, I will fill in the rest. Okay, Chris. All I'll right, stop thanks. now. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Crescent, how do you keep students the focus of your role as superintendent? That's a great question. So um, I would hope that people would ask about me and I hope that the first thing that they would say is I'm an absolute student advocate. I started my career um, caring about kids, learning what works, learning what doesn't work. And I always keep students at the focus of each and every um, decision. Good school districts must do that. That is, they are our client. Um, and yet, um, even more importantly, that's why we all come to work without students. Really, all of this is adults trying to, you know, um, impact change. And if it does not impact students, then we really need to ask some hard questions of ourselves. So I am very passionate about students. I love to talk to kids. I love student voice. We have two students on our board. Um, and they have, um, as well as others, and they have impacted uh, change at the board level. Um, so that's who I am. That's my passion. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Next All one. right. Sure. Yeah. How, do you, how do you feel the district could better support and increase opportunities for special education students, most specifically those in district level programs? And what would be your three year plan to do so? So not knowing all the specifics, so um, I, I would need to know and understand the impacts of the programs that we're talking about. I have a huge, huge passion for students furthest from educational justice. I started my career in a very high poverty, um, free and reduced lunch um, school. And I am very aware that um, special education is general education first. As a mother and as a, um, an aunt of us, um, I have a, a nephew who is severely impacted um, academically and cognitively. And I know the difference that it makes when he was in school, he's older now. And so as a, as a parent and as a leader, I would partner with the appropriate, you know, the, the special education, both the educators, the directors, and to look at the, those programs, making sure that, you know, we have outside agency um, to be able to come in and look at how things are done. But, but more importantly, I think it's more important to really talk with parents. How is their experience in Peninsula School District? What has it been there? experience? What are the highlights? And what are some areas that they really, really want their children to be in, right? Where can we grow? Um, I don't have all those answers tonight. I am not going to presume that I know that, but I do know that I'm very open to conversations. In the district that I am in now, we have looked at a variety of different programs and added when I first came to Eatonville, we did not have all day kindergarten. We had that was one of the first moves that we made with the board, all day kindergarten. We had very limited, very limited preschool. We have robust preschool programs for both special education students and at the same time having general education students. We looked at a variety of different programs that would enhance um, students and student learning, but in innovative ways, different ways. You know, we've implemented things like um, we've brought in therapy dogs with some of our um, students that have uh, issues with executive function um, and not, you know, not just once, but they are an everyday kind of occurrence. And it's not just our special education children. It's actually all of our children. So what is good for all is good for every single student, regardless 
if they have an IEP, regardless if they have a 504, you know, we will do what needs to happen with children. Um, we've looked very closely at our uh, programs, especially in elementary, making sure that inclusion is a priority, making sure that all students feel like they are part of um, the system and that we work with families. Um, we have instituted outdoor kindergarten. I am a huge proponent of children being outside and learning. Um, as I said before on, on Saturday, those of you that I come from a very Scandinavian background, you know, folk schools in Scandinavia and outdoor schools, forest preschools, those things, um, I am very much an advocate for. I'm very passionate. We did, we have started a farm program and it's not just it's not just our special education students or our students for this from educational justice, it's all students. We have gifted students in that program. We have students that want to move and they want to be outside of a brick and mortar school. So I come to this role as being a problem solver, to being open, um, but even more importantly, to be a listener. So I'm not gonna make any assumptions. Um, I am not, yesterday, the candidate had in, you know, lots of experience and wonderful man. I love him. Um, I, I have great respect for him. I am not gonna make assumptions that I know about Peninsula School District because I have not been in here. So, but what I come with is a very open mind. I have no assumptions or preconceptions. I have no um, ulterior motive or um, anything that would inhibit um, my learning and being very um, eager to serve um, all students in Peninsula School District. Thanks, Chris. Sure. Creston, what's your plan to promote and grow the diversity, equity, and inclusion culture of the district? That is, how will you provide professional development, district and school-wide conversations, and a safe culture for discussions around racism? What else will you do to promote staff growth in this area, and how have you modeled equity in your own life? That is a great question. And I have heard that theme throughout today. So I do want the audience to know that I am listening for those. Um, my entire life, if you look at my career, I have started um, and been very well supported and well trained around the, the concept um, and the practice of using an, an equity lens of enhancing um, diversity and um, and inclusion. And so what I come to this role with is really mixed. So 28 years in Tacoma, um, I have so much respect for all of the educators that I've worked with and all of the professional development. We have done significant work. We did significant work during our school improvement grant time around incorporating voices um, and incorporate and listening to families. Um, and, and getting to know them and having a relationship. So the first thing that I know is without a relationship and without open, um, it, this is a journey, right? This is not, and I did say this on Saturday, but I would like to reiterate this. This is not just since this year. This is not based upon the pandemic. This is an obligation that we have for the future of, of um, our students, but this is also an obligation for our own um, journey through equity and diversity. So the first thing that I absolutely know is that we take people where they are. And so I am a Caucasian woman, right? Um, who has worked for years and years to make sure that I understand all aspects of racial diversity, those students furthest from historically um, uh, underserved populations. I need to listen first and I need to keep listening and I need to understand and I need to be an ally. So that's my own personal journey and my commitment for 28 years in Tacoma and the work that we are doing in Eatonville currently right now. They were very different environments. So I was in very urban, very diverse. And when I took over as superintendent uh, eight years ago, um, it was a different. It was a different environment for me. I was not used to um, uh, more of a, a primary uh, Caucasian culture, and yet 
um, having those conversations are the most important thing, but you cannot do those without relationship. I know that this year has been very, very painful. It's been painful for generations, for many cultures and people. And so to assume that I know that the work, I don't know the work that has been done in Peninsula. What I do know is this. I know that we start where we need to start. Currently, we are working with Puget Sound ESD with our board, um, really around the journey about understanding more about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And also, uh, we have provided quite a bit, um, but not enough yet, um, of professional development for our teachers. Book studies, conversations, um, but the most important thing that I know after years of working with a variety of different people is how much I need to learn and that it's never going to be enough. So we start where we are, we are courageous about that, and then we are allies. But the most important thing is you need to see proof in the systems that we set up. Is there equity for all? Is there access? Who is being served, who is not being served? Looking at the data, but more importantly, looking at opportunities for children. Do we have barriers for children? Or do we have doors and, and we say all children can? So those are the pieces in systems that I am very well aware of and will be looking for. So I would, I would welcome a further opportunity to, to have that conversation. One thing that I know that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not, it's not DEI or IED or however, you know, people want to use an acronym. It is about a journey and it is really about children and serving children better and becoming more aware and being advocates for all children as they move forward into this world. And I think at no point that I've ever been in this seat or any seat in education, is that more important? Thanks, Chris. Great, thank you. Preston, your resume is impressive and you're doing great work at the state level to support and promote public education. How do you balance being a superintendent in a district our size with all of the other commitments that you have to the education community? That's a great question. So there are some of those things on that very impressive resume, as you said, Chris. <laughs> um, it's long, I know. I'm gonna say that it's because I'm very active, not that I'm old, right? Um, you know, you're in long enough and you're eager enough to sit at the table and say, yes, yes, I'd like to learn about that. Yes, I would like to make changes with that. Yes, I would like to have an opinion, right? Um, so there are many of those things. I was blessed and very honored um, to be elected as the president of WASA, which is the representative uh, body for the superintendents and central office for the state of Washington. I served last year and lo and behold, I did not know that I would also have the privilege of being the only superintendent in WASA to serve during the pandemic. There has been a lot of work around that I could not have told you, even this time last year, all of the work that would be going around the Department of Health, um, being at the table with a variety of different stakeholders as we develop the reopening guidelines, having opinions from a school perspective. So all of those things. I do not anticipate that many of those things um, are going to continue. I, I am the past president, which is great because now I can just attend and not be responsible. So a lot of the responsibilities that you see on there um, were honors. I was so honored and I learned so much and I've made so many dear, dear connections. Um, but I would be committed to Peninsula School District. I need to learn everything that I need to know. And that takes time, it takes commitment. It takes me being in the buildings. Now, one thing that I know that people will say is I attend things. I am there. I am out and about. I am at every elementary, middle and high school. I go to events, but not just events, music events, art events. And I do have to say this, I go really because I love it, right? My children are grown and that's what I do. Um, it gives me great joy 
to see children and families doing these amazing things. In fact, I'll give an example. So I was so sad that we could not do our holiday, you know, usually in elementary, we do a holiday event. And so we created one at the district office. It was all on Zoom. So we sent it out to all these families. I did the intro with my dog, Cooper, um, with my hat on. And so we pieced it all together, um, but families sat at home. And this is actually a cool thing. There's, there's some cool things that have come out of this pandemic. Um, we said, hey, get your popcorn. And all these families, there were um, children, they played music, they sang, we had some dancing. But you know that's something I think we're going to continue, much like your graduation, where the kids graduated and there were cars and there were parades. So you know we need to seize those really awesome things that we we have done. So I know I answered more than just the question, but thanks. Sounds Chris. good. Sure. Yeah. How would you handle making decisions that are necessary for our students' education and success mm -hmm. as global citizens, but that maybe unpopular within the public. Can you give an example of when you've had to do this before? Hmm. I can give an example. I can give an example of what we did and, and the decisions that we could have made. So when I, so let me back up and say, the decisions that we make for children, um, I think all the time they are difficult, right? If we're absolutely looking fiscally um, versus if we're looking at what's best for kids. So if we hold that North Star, what is best for all children? What is the best outcome for all kids? And we have to make, we have to make decisions. As a superintendent, I'm going to make decisions. And any decision I make, half of the people will love it. Half of the people will not love it, right? Let's take snow days, right? Half of the, yeah, snow days. So a decision that I inherited um, was when I took over as the superintendent um, there, the board had been very clear prior to my getting there that there was uh, an elementary school that was looking at closure, right? And so this closure was really a fiscal closure and an enrollment closure, all right? So there were less than a hundred students in the school. The school was a historical school. It had been there. It really was the last school in that rural area. And so really was the lifeblood of that, that area. Um, the decision had been made that if they had not raised $400,000 or so um, and met certain metrics that, um, that they may be closed, right? So that would be a very, very hard decision for a community. When I came in, you know, I gave guidance to the board that um, raising $400,000 in a year was really not a doable situation to expect that teachers would raise that amount of money. So we worked really hard as a board and superintendent together around the concept of the, the other part was the metric was to uh, transform into STEM school. Um, and at the end of the first year and into the second year, we did a transformation from K-5 to K-8, and we improved, we increased that enrollment and parents enrolled um, double and a half. And so it was vibrant um, and therefore we did not have to close that school, but we really took that conversation off the table. Um, and that school still is thriving to this day and really has been a uh, stalwart green school, innovative school and a STEM school. So that's one example. Thanks. Okay. What is your vision for student learning in the arts in elementary and secondary schools? The arts in elementary and secondary school. Well, we love the arts, right? So I'm a former, I, I danced in high school. I do not play an instrument, although I absolutely love music. I never learned to play. So I do apologize to all of the musicians out there, but I do want to tell you um, that I have sponsored that work very, very heavily. So um, we have looked at um, implementing. So one of our schools wanted to be an art school. They wanted to be a STEAM school, including the arts. Um, so we implemented the arts impact curriculum. We hired um, uh, an artist 
to work. And so she uh, is full time down in that elementary school and the community um, has just had an uproar. We've had an arts walk um, and all of that. I believe very strongly that children have a variety of different talents and especially when they're young, aligning our work um, uh, with best practices for brain development and how music allows students to really, really learn deeply. And so I have partnered uh, with uh, Dr. Linda Miller from uh, PLU and her husband, Dr. Miller, Dr. and Dr. Miller. Uh, we've partnered in a variety of different uh, ways. They have come through and done audits in our school district. We do have music in all three of our elementaries, our middle and high school. We do not have the population to be able to put choir, which is breaking my heart, or strings, which I absolutely would support a hundred thousand times. We have partnered with a scholarship fund um, with Cindy McTee. Cindy McTee is an alumnus and she is a world renowned composer. We partnered with PLU and brought in her music with the PLU and they played with our drum, their drum line. We do that at the high school with the elementary, middle and high school. They all have a part. And that that is a scholarship fund evening that we do um, and that all that money goes right back to the students for private lessons. So those are just little pieces of how I believe very strongly in partnering with community and need and desire. I know that Peninsula has excellent, excellent arts. You do have dance. You do have all of the pieces for a comprehensive um, for, uh, arts program. Um, in the elementaries, I'm not as familiar with what is there. So I would be eager to find out and to see what the need is and to see what the desire is because I am all about that. Anything that allows students to develop their passions and to perform. Those are all 21st century skills, being able to do all of those. So I look forward to further conversations. Kristen, from your experience, how would you begin to repair relationships with parents and guardians who have lost trust in the school district administration? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting conversation. So I would need to know more about that. But what, here's what I would speak to. Trust is built over time. Trust is built with an open and a relationship, open, honest relationship. I don't know any other way to lead. So what I know about repairing anything after being married for 35 years, right? 36, or maybe it's 40, I don't know. But after being married for so long, you know, relationships matter and it takes work. So what I would ask is meet me. Let's know each other. Let me, I don't know. I don't know the background, right? I don't know what the distrust is, whether it's part of pandemic. I don't know all those pieces, but what I can say is that I am a partner I am a proven educational leader that listens and partners with families. It matters to me. It matters both as a grandmother with little ones that will be coming through systems. It matters that public education is still valued. Um, we had an opportunity to really look at some amazing schools, private schools. And two years ago, we went to Poland on behalf of the State Department. My husband and I were sent over there to really look at and talk with um, educators from private schools, international schools. We went to the CISA um, in Poland and we had an opportunity to tour and to talk with international school leaders and teachers. And one thing I know being a State Department uh, child as well as a military child is that our community demands us to be partners, right? We are the best only when we're together and we need to provide excellent programs and they will continue to change. Like this pandemic, this has been a really difficult time for families, for institutions, for organizations, and it's an opportunity. So let's not waste this. Let's have a conversation. Let's reconnect. Let's look at recovery. Let's look at relationships in a way that maybe we haven't had, had to do before like 
the simple fact, Chris, that you're the only one on my screen and that I am interviewing for a job where I should see a hundred people and I should say, hello, how are you? Like, how are, you know, high five and all of that. Um, it's a different world. And so leading during chaos and uncertainty demands that leaders, number one, are vulnerable enough to speak the truth. And number two, we will do things differently. So I am a, stu I am a superintendent that I believe in community. I want to move to Peninsula. There's a variety of different reasons, both with family and the fact that my husband and I spent so much time here and we've raised our children and this is a next phase. I am not a superintendent that's gonna come and want to leave in three years. You can look in my past. I stay in chunks of time. I don't know if I just can't figure it out then, right? Or I just have to stay. Um, the problem is I fall in love with people, right? It's the benefit. It's my passion. So I am looking at a change for 10 years, nine years. I don't come and go. So with that, I would ask for parents to reach out and give an opportunity. I would love the opportunity. Thank you. Creston, what's your vision for education in the future? And how do you intend to move Peninsula School District in that direction? Well, the first thing is I need to deeply understand where Peninsula is now. So that would be my first 100 days. It probably would be the first full, full year of asking and connecting and collaborating, understanding, right? I'm not going to come in and say, well, this is exactly what I know needs to happen, right? I think that any leader that would come in with that, you should be questioning because I do need to understand and I do need to have a connection and I do need to be the leader into the future. I do understand, back to my resume, I do sit on the governing board and have the privilege to work with other superintendents all throughout the nation. That's what the job is. So I was elected. There's one of four in the state of Washington. There's myself and three others. We meet, right now we're meeting virtually, but we get together with our governing board through AASA and we talk about education. We look at future right? We look at the future of education. Where exactly it's going, I can tell you a few things. It is more personalized. There is a higher accountability. We have been brought into, public education has brought, been brought into, as it is right now, with all of, the, all of the families that are sitting and listening to me, you are seeing me in your home. Teachers have been brought into the home. Educators have been brought into the home. And so that has the effect of you know what? Educators are doing a great job and the job is really hard and there is a higher accountability. We know that all children must succeed. We cannot have any children not reach graduation. 100% of graduation must be the goal. And if we don't meet that, we need to have a story about each and every child. We know that the future relies on students to have their 21st century skills. So we need to look at our programs. Are we having students do authentic work? Do they do real work, like research-based work? Or are they just doing what we've done in the past, right? So we have to be very critical about, do we have students that are doing work? Do they have choice and do they have voice? This is a generation of students with the cell phone and the immediate, you know, Amazon. We have changed over the last, well, certainly over the last year, but really this has been a progression. So public schools absolutely have to partner with parents and be prepared for that next generation of students. We have to accelerate students, right? We have to provide what they need, whether it's acceleration or intervention. And it needs to be early, it cannot be late, and it needs to be based not just on scores, not just on assessments. So Chris, I see public education, I see that it's bright, but I also see that we are going to have to adapt. I teach biology, evolution, right? We are in a pandemic. So we know that this is gonna affect our children. We know that the trauma, we're all in a collective trauma, really at no time other than a world war has this event happened worldwide. We're talking worldwide, not just America, not just Peninsula School District. And so we have to anticipate 
and be ready for the changes that we need to implement. And we need to do that with our families. Thank you. Thank you. So about three more questions left. So just okay. to kind of- time. And when is you. our end time then? Uh, seven o'clock and we want to give okay. you some time to right. wrap up. So, okay. Thank you for giving me the time. Sure. I have to put my glasses on. You know, I get <laughs> to that age, boy, Whew, I'm gone. Okay. Kristen, how do you build trust with staff? What role does staff play in strategic planning and implementation? You know, that question has also been asked multiple times today in different ways. So how do I build trust in staff with staff? That really staff. is an honor. Okay. Yep, yep, I know. That really has always been an honor. I have always worked with staff um, shoulder to shoulder as a servant leader, trying to find ways that I can make a difference in their lives to make their lives better, make their growth. I want people, I'm, I'm really at a place in my life now that my commitment is to grow others. I want to... I want to leave a legacy that people under my leadership can dream big, can want certain goals, and that attain those with my assistance, um, removing barriers. That has always been, it has been my privilege and honor to be in this role because people have done that for me. And I will be paying that back each and every day for the rest of my career and probably for the rest of my life. So to work with staff, we're talking a variety of different staff. And if we're talking about a strategic plan and what people believe and what people value and what, what the determination and the direction for a school district is, we have to include people. We have to include every voice that we can because that is what uh, an effective school district, um, that is what a strategic plan can do. Now, a strategic plan can just be a little folder on the side you know, of your table. It can go into a Google Doc and never be looked at again. So what I'm talking about is a strategic plan that moves organizations, that is systemically moving over time with everyone, not that is top down, <clears throat> not that is created with just a couple people but that people have an opportunity. That's how people move, is that you invite them in the door. You say, you matter. I care about you. What do you think? Those are the pieces for anything, any movement. So with this, with Peninsula Strategic Plan, you bet that staff are important. You bet that families are important. I advocate that we start with children. What do children think? What do children need at all levels? Because, you know, kids will tell you, I taught middle school for a long time. I don't have a lot of ego anymore, right? They will just tell you. And all of you that have your 13 and 14 year old kids sitting with you right now, you know, because I have raised my own. Um, so with that, um, Marrying those and nesting those takes time, right? So I'm a firm believer in the work around strategic plan and the promoting and advocating and including all staff in that and all community. So thanks, Chris. Sure. I'm looking at the timer. You're good. <laughs> You're good. Two left. Tick, tick, uh, tick. In your opinion, how much of a problem does bullying play in our schools today? And what have you done in your previous school district to address and prevent this problem from occurring? So Chris, you are talking to a former middle school uh, principal as well as middle school director. Um, bullying is a reality. It always has been. Um, students, they are children. So let's be clear about that. And children behave really well and at times they're trying on other things and they, behave, and they don't behave well, they behave badly. And then you layer on the ability, which at no time in, <clears throat> in my past, but is their reality now is the whole digital age, right? People can do things anonymously. Um, digital citizenship is absolutely crucial, right? Bullying online, bullying in person. It has to be 
absolutely stated and explicit in all schools that it is intolerable. And the alternative is love, kindness, and this is how we teach. So if we don't teach kids how to behave in very explicit ways, and I know, I'm telling you, elementary teachers are the absolute best at this. I have seen this in action year after year after year. Sometimes we don't do that in middle and high school as explicitly, right? So encouraging programs, Character Strong is one that I know has been mentioned, but there are multiple other programs. Focusing on children and belonging, focusing on the affective. So I'm a former health teacher and I tell you what, we talked about this on an ongoing basis. And as a leader and a superintendent and walking through that journey educationally and where I have been, I absolutely want to help families when students are having that difficult time around bullying intimidation. And we will be addressing that. Um, those pieces are very serious. They can be long reaching and they are not to be looked away. So as a former mother, well, I'm still a mother, but a former, you know, mother of little children um, and multiple siblings. I know that some children um, are more, um, it's harder for them to learn that lesson, to be kind, right? It's just harder. And so we have to be very, very, um, we have to work with parents. One of the joys that I have had being a little bit older, especially when uh, I was in the middle school in the director role is really meeting with parents because, you know, I'm old, my kids now have their own children, they're gonna be going through the system. And so just allowing parents to know that it's, it's a natural part of, upbringing. And these are ways that we can help you with your child. These are ways that we are not going to tolerate. We don't tolerate bullying. But the digital part is very, very interesting because we see adults engaged in that as well, right? It's much easier to tear down than it is to build up. So thanks, Chris. Sure. Creston, last question. What have you done in your career as superintendent to support early learning and to support and level up all children entering kindergarten as to introduce a strong foundation. And what are your plans for our district with that age group? So I'm not going to just start with plans for this. <laughs> what I will start with is ideas. I've talked a little bit about them. Um, early learning really has been a joy. I have learned so much being a superintendent because, you know, I really was very, very secondary based. So I have a very deep knowledge of that. And so I, I have come to early learning with real, it's been a joy to see the hard work. Um, one thing I know about children, so this is really one of my core values. I am a very curious person myself. Like I went into science because I like to ask, I like to know, I like to ask questions. I like to not know, right? I like that. that I love wonder, imagination and curiosity. And one thing that schools cannot do is that they, they must not um, educate that out of children. We have to have it every level. So in early learning, there is no other time that students are scientists, mathematicians, artists, you know, you ask the young kids. So the more opportunity that we have for children to experience a whole variety of different ways of learning, both with the written language, but also the spoken language and music and art and that just lends itself to preschool programs. I'm also a fierce advocate, and I'm going to say it again. I love project-based learning. I love authentic learning, outdoor. So we started an outdoor. We had, it was like, okay for outdoor. So it was our kindergarten program. It was funded um, through OSPI. They gave us some money. We got these cool t-shirts. I am okay with kindergarten, outdoor kindergarten. And we had our middle and high school students um, teach the elementary kids and they came through, they all planted their pumpkins. So this happened over a period of time with our grits farmers. And I haven't really talked about that, but we have a farm with our middle and high school kids. It's a, it's a half day program and they're out there every, they have never closed for the pandemic. They've been out there every day since September, um, but they're outside doing uh, project-based learning and, and planting. So they planted with all of our preschool and elementary kids. And then 
So that was in the spring of last, I think they got it in for last year. Maybe they didn't, maybe I'll talk about a year uh, prior to. And then in the fall, when we got our new kinders and our new preschool, the kids came out, had a lesson, and then they got to pick their own um, pumpkins. But those are things I love to sponsor, maker spaces, anything that gets kids active and outside and eager for learning is only a benefit in early learning. Thanks. Great. Thank you. That's the end of our questions. So we'll give you a couple minutes if you'd like to wrap up and say anything else. And we'll, well close out. Well, Chris, we've had this intimate conversation <laughs> all night. So I'm sure. glad at least you're on. Um, I would like to speak to the families that, are, that have tuned in. Thank you so much um, for tuning in, first of all, um, to taking time out of your own family um, time. Um, thank you so much for inviting me into your home and inviting. I'm very, very honored to be one of two of your candidates. Um, I so would love the opportunity. And I do want to let you know that I come from a place. I love Eatonville community as well. And so um, I'm just very, very, um, I'm very honored and I'm very humbled. So thank you for a great evening. I hope you got to see a little bit of who I am. I'm sorry we're not in person but hopefully we'll have that opportunity. So thanks, Chris, and hi, Wayne. Hi, Kristen. Thank you very much, Kristen. That was great. Chris Hagel, thank you very much for your role these last two evenings and for all the support your technology department has provided. And thank you to the many staff members who have contributed Absolutely. to the success of all of our activities for the past several months. Uh, that concludes the public portion of uh, our search activities for today. And we'd like to invite um, participants and observers to go to the district website and complete the survey um, that allows you to provide input into the process. The, the board of directors will pay close attention to your input and will um, that'll be very valuable as they deliberate and move toward making a final selection. Thank you very much. Good evening. Bye everybody. Hey, we done?